This is one of those films that I've seen scattered throughout the comments section, and as of recent, specially requested by a Patreon. Which means one of two things. One, it's going to be incredibly weird. Two, it's going to be incredibly dark. In this case, however... It's both. Pinocchio and the Emperor of the Night was released on Christmas Day 1987. Boy, what a treat that must have been. It was produced by Filmation and is set a year after Pinocchio has turned into a real boy. And although this is meant to be a sequel to the book and not the 1940 Disney film, there is still some similarities to be seen. And though the Disney film was renowned for having its darker and weirder moments, this film says, hold my beer, and really does go all out. So, let's jump on in and take a look at the plot. The film begins where we see an overly British bee named Lieutenant Grumblebee. Get it? Like Bumblebee? Grumblebee is woken from his sleep when a mysterious carnival turns up and magically sets itself up on the land, run by a creepy looking puppet master and an ominous voice coming from inside. Yes, a perfect spot for the carnival. Grumblebee, alarmed by what he has seen, declares, fuck this shit, and makes a hasty retreat. We then cut to Pinocchio's house, where Geppetto is making him a birthday cake to celebrate his one year anniversary of becoming a real boy. Morning, father! Surprise! Why did you give him that scowl before revealing the cake? You trying to trick him that he was in trouble or something? Bit psychopathic? Despite the sinister fake out, Pinocchio is delighted with his present. Gee willikers! I didn't know I had a birthday! And I must say, even though this isn't meant to be connected to the 1940 Disney film, the voice actor, Scott Grimes, for Pinocchio does a really good job at imitating the voice from the Disney version. And fun fact, Scott Grimes voicing Pinocchio in this would later go on to voice Steve in American Dad. Is it weird to have a boner? The fairy godmother then turns up to join the celebrations. What is with that facial expression? I get that he's shocked to see her, but did he really need to have the bloodshot eyes? She then proceeds to congratulate Pinocchio on his one year anniversary. Seriously, what is up with these faces? She then proceeds to sing a song about love and freedom, whilst Pinocchio continues to stare at her like some sort of psychopath. Yeah, I'd say despite being a real boy, it seems Pinocchio may still have a lot of wood left on him. Is it weird to have a boner? Before the fairy leaves, she warns Pinocchio that someone may try to turn him back into a puppet. He might even become a puppet again. Who could turn me back into a puppet? I really must go now. Happy birthday. Okay, yeah. Well, thanks for the warning and lack of follow-up information. Just gonna turn up to my birthday party and leave on that bombshell. Come back, you stupid bitch! She also brings to life a wooden globe bug carving that Pinocchio made. Because, you know, she loves playing god like that. Come to think of it, with Pinocchio once being made out of wood himself, would creating another wooden creature be like carving out flesh to him? Then again, yeah, I can totally see him being into that kind of thing. Feels good! Pinocchio then offers to deliver a valuable jewel box to the mayor. Along his route, Pinocchio is tempted to go to the carnival, but is stopped by his new glow bug friend, Jiminy Cricket? Gee willikers! Willikers? You got a nice ring to it. Willikers it is! Oh, yeah, I forgot. Copyright. And yeah, fun fact, Disney did actually try to sue this film, but we'll get onto that a bit later. Soon, Pinocchio also meets a raccoon named Scalawag, get it, like Scallywag, and a monkey named Igor, which I couldn't connect to an obvious pun, but after a quick google search, apparently Igor is the term used for a generic lab assistant. So good job film. 
Scalawag and Igor, who definitely aren't carbon copies of the fox and the cat from the Disney film, scam Pinocchio into trading his jewellery box for a fake pharaoh's ruby. Gee willikers! Seriously, what is with Pinocchio and these satanic faces they keep giving him? It's a deal. When Pinocchio tells this to Geppetto, you did what? He isn't too happy with the news. So Pinocchio decides to run away from home and goes off to join the carnival. What is with this scenery change? During the day it looked like it was set in a summery woodland, but now it's surrounded by dead trees? Whilst at the carnival, Pinocchio falls in love with a puppet named Twinkle, who also looks a bit like a serial killer. And again, is seeing that puppet dangle on strings just like seeing a dangling corpse to Pinocchio? She's beautiful. The puppet master, Puppetino, says he recognises Pinocchio from an old puppet that he used to have. Name was Pistachio. That's Pinocchio, and I'm not a puppet anymore. My fairy godmother turned me into a real boy! Okay, why would you tell him this? Assuming this guy is meant to be like the evil puppet master who captured Pinocchio from the Disney version, don't you think it would have been wise not to give away your identity? Or maybe if someone who had foreseen all of this coming could have warned you about this guy in particular? I really must go now, you stupid bitch! Pinocchio soon finds himself turning back into a puppet in what has to be one of the creepiest scenes I've seen in a long time. Wait! I want to stop! Please! You'll stop when I want you to! Help! I didn't know that I- Seriously, what the fuck? The distorted music? The creepy puppet imagery? Along with Pinocchio's cries for help? and that final tear which rolls down his face. It's like a disturbing combination from that monkey dancing scene in Hey Arnold and the puppet episode from Courage the Cowardly Dog. <laughs> oh, I don't feel quite to myself. Christ, I don't think even that creepy donkey scene from the original Pinocchio even squares up to this. And that's really saying something. Jimmy Cricket, uh, I mean Willikers, escapes the house in order to find Pinocchio. Along the way, he manages to rescue Grumblebee from a set of spiders. I see. <laughs> on, old chap. What a chicken. <laughs> I would. Seriously, just how British is this bee? Grumblebee reveals that he's a member of the RAB, the Royal Airbugs. Get it? Royal Air Force? Honestly, I think a better name would have been Royal Air Swarm. Not only is it more fitting for Swarm to substitute force, but the RAS sounds closer to the RAF than the RAB. Grumblebee agrees to fly Willikers towards the carnival, where he discovers Pinocchio's unfortunate fate. Luckily, the Deus Ex Machina fairy. Yep, see, I made sure to pronounce it right this time. Deus Ex Machina. Is around to bring Pinocchio back to life. Gosh, man, I, uh, Pinocchio, uh, I know. Yes, I had foreseen all of this coming, but let it happen anyway. Puppetino's master will be very angry he lost you. His master? Who? I hope you never have to find out. Again, thanks for the useless information, fairy. You stupid bitch. After becoming free, Pinocchio now decides that he must go and get the jewelry box back for Geppetto. What are you talking about? What you talking about, Willis? Scallywag and Igor then happen to coincidentally bump into Pinocchio again. My, how convenient. And tell him that if he wants his jewellery box back, then he will have to get it back from the carnival. Only telling Pinocchio this because they know if they turn him into Puppetino, they will be granted a big reward. Willicus, meanwhile, also coincidentally bumps into Grumblebee again. My, how convenient who I think is meant to be intoxicated off this plant nectar? And I had just made a brief stop for a little nip of fuel. I'd say you had one nip too many. Kind of reminds me of that drunk wasp we see from the Ants movie, who turns to alcoholism after his wife is murdered. 
Jesus, that film is actually pretty dark coming to think about it. Besides, it's what my Wadley Giddles would want. <laughs> After saving Grumblebee's town from a menacing toad, the bugs agreed to send out a search party to find Pinocchio. Don't mention it, my good man. When the going gets tough, the tough gets fuzzy. Get it? He said buzzing instead of going? Because they're bugs? Also, looking at this scene, why is it that all the other bugs look like, well, bugs? Whilst Grumblebee pretty much looks like a human in a bee costume. I mean, he doesn't even have any antennas under his hat. Back to Pinocchio, the three are setting sail for the carnival, but while Scalawag and Igor are fishing, they are suddenly pulled into the water by a giant barracuda, which kind of reminds me of the big fish from Tom and Jerry. <laughs> Pinocchio though, manages to save them both, which actually makes them begin doubting whether turning Pinocchio in is the right thing to do. Eventually the trio arrive at the carnival ship, with Grumblebee and Willikus not too far behind. Oh, but Willikus, I- Don't worry! I can float! Yep, and you can also rot. Pinocchio is told by a mysterious boatman that he can have a ride to the jewelry box, but along the way, Pinocchio is distracted by the sound of partying coming from a different direction. It's a place where children get anything they wish for. Yeah, which again, sounds very similar to a certain situation that happened in another certain film. Which again, I know this isn't meant to be a sequel to the Disney film in particular, but given this is a sequel to the original events which also featured in the book, shouldn't Pinocchio be wised up to this by now? Considering, you know, what happened last time? Pinocchio heads in and begins drinking beer, leading to more psychopathic facial expressions. Oh good, I was wondering when the next trippy freakout would occur in this film. Scalawag and Igor do try saving Pinocchio, but unfortunately fail, and after another trippy musical number, we finally meet the face behind the mysterious voice that we heard from earlier on. The Emperor of the Night, who fun fact, is actually voiced by the legendary James Earl Jones. The Emperor of the Night, you are in my domain now. Now this is where the film really starts to take a dark turn. Like, a really dark turn. Uh, both dreams and come true. And the whole plot suddenly gets super complicated. So this villain guy needs Pinocchio to sacrifice his freedom because it's his freedom that gives the fairy godmother her powers. If the only puppet ever to get his freedom were to lose it would be a terrible blow to the good fairy. It might even destroy her. Like, okay, I guess? But if that's the case, you'd think he'd also be just as obsessed with Willikers, seeing as how he was a wooden creature who's also gained sentient life from the fairy? But no, Willikers has just casually tossed out the ship. Luckily though, Grumblebee manages to find Willikers in the incredibly thick fog. Hogs as thick as Yorkshire pudding, but not half as tasty. Get it? Because Yorkshire puddings are British things? Back on the ship, Pinocchio gets given his jewel box, but finds that Geppetto has been shrunken down inside of it. So Pinocchio agrees to sign away his freedom if his father and the rest of the friends get set free. Just when all hope seems lost, the fairy godmother turns up and miraculously saves the day. No, that would have been too logical. Instead what happens, and I'm not making this up, instead, Pinocchio says that with his freedom of choice, he chooses that he and everyone else will get to go home safely, which somehow creates a blue aura around him, causing him to shrink the emperor down to size. Seriously, that's what happens. But then just as they are about to escape the ship, the Emperor returns, despite being seemingly defeated earlier, but once again, Pinocchio gains his blue aura and runs in to save the day. Yeah, apparently the blue aura is meant to be coming from his fairy godmother, 
which has never been a thing throughout the rest of this film. But also I find it strange that despite the villain being out to get the fairy godmother, she actually doesn't turn up to help the others defeat him. We cut to the riverbed where everyone has been washed ashore, but believe Pinocchio to be dead. But thanks to Pinocchio being able to prove himself as brave, truthful and unselfish, it seems Pinocchio is not only alive, but has also been transformed back into a real boy, again. Like seriously, where have I heard this revelation before? And again, I'll say, I know it's not meant to be a sequel to the Disney film, but it is meant to be a sequel to the original story, and this is the very lesson he learns in the original story. So why is it a revelation that he's learning the exact same lesson all over again? Not only is Pinocchio a real boy though, but Twinkle has also been turned into a real girl. Why was Twinkle transformed exactly? She didn't do anything in this film and wasn't even sentient throughout any of it. She was just a random puppet that Pinocchio fell in love with. Now that the conflict is over, the fairy godmother finally appears to give Pinocchio back his jewel box. Farewell Pinocchio, I don't think you'll be needing me anymore. Yeah well it's not like you were much help anyway. You stupid bitch. And so all is good and happy and everyone heads back home, including Scalawag and Igor, which I'm assuming means they're now going back to live with Pinocchio, Twinkle and Geppetto? And that was Pinocchio and the Emperor of the Night. So what are my thoughts on it? Plot wise, it's kinda weak. Despite this meant to be taking place a year after Pinocchio has turned into a real boy, Pinocchio himself doesn't really feel like he's progressed as a character. He still falls for the same old tricks and still makes the same old mistakes. So when he does learn his lesson towards the end, it kind of just feels like we're stepping on old ground, making the film feel a bit wooden. There's also a few elements borrowed from the Disney movie, such as the raccoon and monkey being carbon copies of the cat and fox, Willikers being a copy of Jiminy Cricket, and the puppet master being very similar to Stromboli. And apparently Disney thought this too, as they actually launched a lawsuit against Filmation for copyright infringement. Good old copyright. The courts however, ruled against Disney, stating that the characters in the film were more based off the original book and because the book's characters are in public domain, Filmation was within its rights to use them. Yeah, sorry Disney, you don't win this one. Though maybe it was this court ruling that inspired Disney to then go on and borrow ideas from other franchises to make their own. Cough. And to be fair and credit this film, it did go off to try and create its own plotline towards the end, but again, it did feel kind of sudden and the whole revelation to that felt very unearned and kind of forced. However, one thing I did quite like about the plot was the character transformation of Scalawag and Igor, as to how they actually became more empathetic to Pinocchio and ended up becoming good people because of it. Really wasn't expecting something like that. I'm afraid we all let our judgement be swayed by our desires. Alright, let's take a look at the animation. The animation, for its budget and for a theatrical release, is really not that great. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad by any means, but compare this to The Secret of Nim which was released around the same time, with a 3 million dollar smaller budget, Secret of Nim has much better animation. And I know we talked about how that's part due to the animators working extended hours, but still, I think for 10 million dollars, this film should have been to a higher quality. There are moments in the film where the animation does shine through, with the song numbers, some facial expressions, and especially with the animation of the Emperor towards the end, but for the most part, it looks like something you'd expect for a director video release. The music on the other hand, I actually think is really good. Every track used feels incredibly different from the last, but they each sound solid on their own merit. From the creepy theme we get of the carnival, to the joyous theme we get of Pinocchio, mm -hmm. 
and the somewhat funky theme we get for Scalawag and Igor. This way? Then there are a few vocal tracks scattered throughout the film as well, which yeah, not exactly breathtaking, but I still found them enjoyable. The song about Pinocchio being a star is definitely stuck in my head right now. Singing, dancing, such romancing, no beginner, you are born a winner. Sadly though, it seems the music wasn't enough to save the film, as it did poorly at the box office only making back 3.2 million out of its 10 million budget. And the critics weren't too kind to it either, with the New York Times calling it a Saturday morning animation at its best, whilst many others negatively comparing it to the Disney film. Now I know I made a lot of references to the Disney film in my review, but I think directly comparing this to the Disney version is a bit harsh. Yeah, it is definitely a step down in quality, but that's an incredibly high bar to set it up against. For one, it was Disney, and Disney was the king of the animation industry throughout the 40s and 50s. And secondly, the Disney film was made when animation was in a far better state, where production values were much higher than they were when this film came out. I mean, in my last review, I even highlighted this quality difference by comparing Disney against Disney from different eras. So I think we should cut the film some slack in that department. But having said that, I can see how this film isn't up to the standard you'd expect for a theatrical release. There are moments of impressive scenes, some good tunes, and plot twists, but these are only moments. And I can honestly say that I wouldn't justify these few moments for the price of a cinema ticket. I think instead a director video would have been a more acceptable release, but seeing as how we're not paying a cinema ticket to go see this, and it is in fact, at the time of this review, freely available to watch on YouTube, I would say, go check it out. It's a nice combination of fun and silly, mixed with a good old dose of dark and disturbing nightmare fuel. Would. Would say to go check it out. Get it guys? Cause they're puppets? Puppets made from wood? Would go see it? Ah.